Not necessarily uh, tribal or regional. All right, welcome back. Let's begin with the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. Uh, and the lead story there says, a Senate rejects Buhari's request, Amechi Malami Ngige, others in tight corner. Uh, and the writers there say, mandated to resign before party primaries. Lawmakers violate understanding with presidents, and this is according to Kari. No time frame for appointees to resign. Uh, this is coming from San. Uh, and then you see a pictorial there that shows you a car burns inside the yard of a hospital in Mariupol, southern Ukraine, just as, uh, you know, the uh, tension is happening in that part of the world. And you see all the stories right at the top on page five. Ukraine war, Western sanctions taking toll on U.S. Nigerian students in Russia. Uh, you also see the story about mixed reactions as air peace, as man, four others form alliance uh, and then you see the story about the witness bandits on 200 bikes kill 13 soldiers five cops in kevy state uh, and then you'd also see the story about uh, federal government bans foreigners from buying produced directly from farmers uh, how 13 year old girl was gang raped by seven men in lagos there we go again uh, you'd also see the story about Buhari gave us clear directive to remove Buni. This is according to Erifai, the governor of Kaduna State. He has not been removed, says Omahi. You'll find the details of that on page 14 on the Daily Trust newspaper. All right, with that, we'll move on to the Nation newspaper. And the lead here talks about El Rafai, 19 APC governors endorse Buni's removal. Uh, Buhari rebuffs lobbyist Yobe Governor uh, Akban uh included for convention committee. Senate caucus stands on CECPC chair. Party releases uh, NWC zoning formula and NEC meeting or NEC meeting for March 17. And then right above that story, you'd find uh, Second Republic House of Reps Speaker Chacha dies. And then Reps invites NNPC, GMD and others. Uh, below that, so you find a story that says Omahi under fire for attacking judge. Ebony governor says I respect judiciary you know, despite the backlash. And then we also have uh, Air Peace, Max, United, three others form alliance. And at the top there, there's a story that says many killed in bandits attack on deputy governor's convoy. Senate refuses to amend electoral act, law and defense action. And then Upper Carries extradition suits for hearing March 23. And why Nigeria can't meet OPEC quota by silver and details of that can be found on page seven these are some of the stories on the front page of the nation newspaper okay let's take a look at some more stories on the punch this morning Bunis lawyers rebels colluded to procure judgment stopping convention and this is coming from the governor of kaduna state nasu erfai uh, and the writers there say buhari 19 governors behind Bunis removal support bello as new chair uh, this is according to uh, the Kaduna state governors. Well, Buni refused to implement reconciliation committee's recommendation, alleges Erfai. APC governors stabbing sick Buni in the back, alleges caretaker secretary. And this is coming from Akbanu Dede. Uh, and you find uh, other stories on the punch this morning. 5G, telcos mall phased rollout. Fair consumers weak purchasing power. Uh, and on page two, on the punch, electoral bill, uh, Malami Amechi barred from primaries, Senate rejects <coughs> Buhari's request. Uh, and then you see the story uh, about airfare hike looms over aviation fuel price. Marketers predict 700 naira per litre. Wow. That's quite wow. uh, alarming. On the high side. Uh, and on page 8, NBA Lambas Umahi sacked governor hires 18 sands to battle appeal. Uh, and then you see a pictorial there of a patrol tanker exploding uh, at a Lagos filling station 
uh, burning down buildings and rendering uh, a number of people homeless. Uh, and then you find other stories just below the pictorial there. 16 security agents killed as bandits attack Kebi Deputy Governor's convoy. Uh, mob lynches suspected on the motorcycle thief. Police arrest four. Uh, and on pages four and five, you'll see the story about Bamiche. Uh, and the House of Representatives is asking federal government to investigate her murder. Uh, decrying female killings. These are some of the major stories on The Punch this morning. All right, with that, we'll move to The Guardian newspaper. We have APC inaugurates convention committee, and details of that can be found on page two. And today being World Kidney Day, why over 20 million Nigerians are living with kidney disease? And you can find details of that story on page nine. On uh, The lead story uh, is on Electoral Act Amendment, uh, lawyers, others hail as Senate rejects Buhari's request. And then we have writers that say Senate gradually asserting its independence, says Adeborua. It is victory for democracy, says Awa Kalu. Uh, lawmakers should be commended for rising above being rubber stamp. Ogbankwa declares time not ripe for further amendment of Electoral Act, Pius insists, and rejection in tune with demands of Nigerians, says CNPP. And just uh, beside that, you find. Uh, a story that says after knocking after knocking Justice Echo, Omar he hires Sands to reclaim Ebony Guba's seat. Four policemen in FG's convoy hospitalized following auto crash in Delta. We also have court overrules duress claims in Hanifa's murder case. And uh, on the Metro page uh, on 13, head of Abakari probe panel DIG Bunike slums dies in Abuja. You'd find a pictorial there of the vice president uh, flanked by secretary to the government of the federation that's boss Mustafa and you know uh, chief of staff to president that's Ibrahim Gambari uh, during a federal executive council meeting at the state house in Abuja and then uh, we also uh, the final story that's on the footnote of the page uh, says that frivolous change of polytechnics in universities. Okay, it's an editorial on page 18. And with that, um, we uh, wrap up some of the stories on The Guardian newspaper. Okay, let's take a look at one more on the blueprint this morning. March 26 convention committee list. APC shots out Buni. Akponu Doide, Fani Kaide, others. Uh, and you see the riders there that say Zones National Chairman to North Central, Southwest gets Secretary. Holds neck meeting Thursday, reduces convention committee members. Buni remains caretaker chairman, and this is according to the Senate caucus. Uh, says he'll return from Dubai, resume in that capacity. And you'd find all the stories right at the top uh, on the Blueprint newspaper this morning. Uh, 72 hours after designation of field stations, Abuja queues ease off. That's, that's, that's good news. Very, 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 very calming. Uh, and you see um, the riders there, commuters, transporters express relief, black marketers increase purchase in anticipation of a relapse. Okay. <laughs> uh, you'd find other stories uh, on the Blueprint newspaper, court ruling, We've hired 18 sons to reclaim our mandate. This is according to Umahi. You must retract, apologize over your comments. NBA tells Ebony State Governor. Uh, and you see a pictorial there. The blueprint also carried that, uh, that story. A tanker burning at mobile filling station in Mushin, Lagos on Wednesday. Uh, Electoral Act, Senate throws out Buhari's request for amendment. you find details of that story on page 18 on the blueprint newspaper. Uh, and for some business on page 20, lack of investments, reason Nigeria can't meet OPEC quarter. This is according to Silva. Uh, Kebi deputy governor escapes as bandits kill 19 security operatives. Uh, and on page 5 on the blueprint, IGP mourns DIG, Egunike, condoles with family. Uh, and then you'd find other stories still on the blueprint. NDLA arrests Taraba drug kingpin. Seven officers injured, vehicles damaged. Uh, and then you see the story about why electricity supply remains unstable 
nationwide, and this is according to the TCN. Dongwate honors late brother, commissions food factory in Kano. These are some of the major stories on the blueprint this morning. Okay, the general editor of Daily Trust, Hamza Idris, is here with us in the studio to give us perspectives of some of the stories making headway this morning. Good morning. Thank you Good for morning. joining us on the program. Good morning, Zaina. Good morning, Zaina. Okay, uh, initially when we were talking about the World Kidney Day, you giggled when we talked about a lot of people <laughs> are selling their kidneys <laughs> for money because we are, we are poor. <laughs> Can you comment on that? Yes, it, it reminded me of a certain teenager in, in China who, without the consent of his parents, out of desperation to have an iPhone, he went and sold <laughs> one of his kidneys. Yeah. And uh, sadly, he wasn't lucky. The, the other one failed. Oh. Yes, because, you know, donating or selling one of your organs, especially kidneys, it comes with um, some um, conditions, especially um, if you also have some underlying um, ailments. And then uh, even if you are fit, you need to take some drugs for some time, according to experts, so that um, you will train the remaining kidney for you to uh, you know live well but that young uh, teenager he was carried away by the euphoria of you know the apps in his um, new iphone and mm -hmm. before you know it you know he also gave up because he died so mm -hmm. it's, it's really sad and uh, it is becoming um, a norm especially in third world countries because of poverty and greed on the side of um, youth they feel that uh, the huge uh, you know amount that comes with giving out one of the kidneys is worth it but uh, of course we need to support one another many people millions of people are there in hospital uh, waiting to have donors but uh, i think we should be uh, cautious in doing it especially if the intention is just to get money to do other things mm. yes very interesting indeed. Uh, now, we are seeing quite a lot of very, very interesting stories on our dailies this morning. Uh, a lot of uh, newspapers are carrying the story about the request by the president to amend the new you know, Electoral Act. And a lot of stakeholders are giving the Senate quite an applaud for refusing you know, his request. Could you comment on that? I pity the president, and I also pity the Senate leadership and especially um, the Senate president. You know, when the president was about signing the uh, amended electoral act, it was with a caveat that he was not comfortable with uh, section 84, subsection 12, which actually um, caged political appointees because it says for them to be delegates for Congresses and conventions and then to also vie for elective positions. All political appointees must have to resign their appointments. And this will definitely affect many ministers because the body language of some of them is already clear that they are going to vie for maybe uh, the presidency. Um, and then you have dozens of heads of federal government agencies who also have um, ambition to probably vie for the governorship seats in their states, maybe Senate, mm -hmm. House of Reps, and what have you. Mm -hmm. And then there are some at the state level who want to buy their commissioners or heads of agencies that want to buy for the governorship or State House of Assembly, or House of Reps, or State House of Assembly, and all that. All these are going to be affected if, you know, this provision stands. But uh, when the president realized that um, the signing or the assent to the Electoral uh, Act was uh, dragging and causing a lot of uh, disaffection, in the polity, he took risk because it was a great risk. <laughs> yes, when he now <coughs> agreed and then signed it, 
uh, but urging the uh, legislators that I'm going to send an amendment. But you can see what happened yesterday. Of course, the Senate president made attempt to save the day by saying um, the, uh, the, the order given by uh, Federal High Court judge uh, could not stand, considering that uh, uh, you know, uh, the judiciary cannot stop um, the legislature from carrying out its job, saying if they allow that to be, it means one day somebody will go to the court and then procure a judgment to even stop the National Assembly from sitting. But that notwithstanding, you can see the outcome. Um, both uh, senators from the two major political parties you know, <laughs> unanimously kicked out. So they hit the president below the belt. Mm. And uh, it's a serious um, setback. But when, uh, on the flip side, uh, many people are really happy with what happened because um, they believe that political appointees um, normally get undue advantage when it comes to election because they use the power of incumbency, the security around them, mm. the enormous resources mm. at their disposal to have advantage over contenders that come from nowhere. All right, so but will that bring a sanity to democracy in Nigeria? Ah, Even though it's I doubt much. Yesterday we were debating it at our editorial uh, okay. meeting and um, some people with knowledge of what is happening um, actually said this is just a temporary measure mm. because you can see um, Nigeria's democracy is like a jollof rice. This is how I, I, I look <laughs> at it. We, we, we said we are practicing American democracy, but mm -hmm. they do this there. I, I doubt much. Uh, there, the, the ground rule is meant to, you know, uh, outlive all the contenders. But here in Nigeria, we do things just to suit our interest. Politicians from top to bottom, they tend to, you know, um, create laws or bylaws and all that in order to solve an immediate problem. And then at the end of the day, you realize that instead of um, solving a problem, you are creating more problems. Mm. Now, unless maybe the, uh, the, the, the president through the office of the attorney general or other um, powerful forces find a way of changing the thinking of uh, members of the National Assembly, uh, we are going to see a lot of uh, problems in the coming days. Because mm -hmm. when you ask people who are holding serious uh, position of authority at you know, uh, election year, asking them to, to resign their positions ahead of primaries, it's a recipe for another vacuum mm -hmm. in governance because mm -hmm. it will definitely affect the way and manner in which uh, government is being run. But on a general note, um, lawyers and then political scientists who commented on the issue uh, said it, it was a good development because uh, you are now going to give a neutral ground where people will answer their names, they will answer their real names. Meaning if, if you didn't perform, uh, it's very unlikely for you to succeed. Um, during primaries of your political party. You know, quite very, very interesting tussle there. Uh, you know, we're also seeing Kari telling, you know, uh, and the lawmakers that they violated their understanding with the president in the first place. Yes, week. you know, he's a political scientist and um, he was speaking based on morality, but there are, you don't have morality in politics. <laughs> it is about permanent interest. He was right. He said there was an understanding because assuming the president, you know, uh, was aware that they will not uh, amend that section, the likelihood was that he will not assent to the bill and uh, it will have been another serious uh, problem. But you see, um, the president is rounding up. Uh, next year, around this time, he will be counting 
days. So we will see more of this um, uh, classical uh, disobedience in court mm. of some of his directives uh, because um, some of the politicians believe that they stand to lose nothing by not abiding by some of the pleas or directives of the president because uh, very soon you are going to have change of guard uh, in the presidency. So uh, many of them will feel that after all he has been there for eight years mm. and then we have to now look for uh, new alliances and so, all that so that we will remain in power. So how does how how do you think that will affect other bills they intend, you know, to give the president to assent to? You know, we have the constitutional amendment actually, you know, uh, still in works and everything. Do you think, you know, uh, if that particular clause is not removed, that the president would actually heed to their demands? Yeah, as I said, he he is um, a helpless of sort now because if the senators from across party lines will overwhelmingly throw away that request is really a serious setback for the president and uh, we're about to see more of that but uh, to, to my understanding as a political reporter they are not actually targeting the the president they are hitting back at their governors. You see, mm. uh, governors are seen as emperors in, in Nigeria. They are so powerful that if you are a governor, you now decide who lives and who dies in, in your state, literally. Because um, even a senator or member of, of House of Preps, there is no way they can get the ticket of their party if they are not in the good books of um, the, the governors. Um, and then um, ministers, of course, they have uh, resources at their disposal. And then you see some of them trying to, um, you know, fight with their governors. Some will want to become governors, some will want to, uh, you know, become presidents and all that. So uh, the legislators uh, see this as an opportunity for them to also uh, hit back at all of these um, people who were maybe uh, appointed by the president or they have executive positions in their cells. So it's actually survival of the fittest mm. that um, is uh, going on now. Hmm. We also seen, uh, you know, a witness reports where uh, he narrated that uh, bandits on 200 bikes killed 13 soldiers, five cops in Kebi State. That's quite uh, very scary, isn't it? Yes, you know, the Minister of Foreign Affairs paid a visit to uh, the state uh, because of um, killings, you know. Zamfara and the neighboring KB and Sokoto states, they are now a killing field, you know. Almost on daily basis, people are being killed, they are being maimed, women being raped, uh, students being abducted. And sadly, the attention of the media is tilted towards uh, political reporting these days, instead of um, giving attention to um, the humanitarian crisis in some states. And unless some of these atrocities are reported, uh, you rarely see the uh, people responsible for tackling some of these emergencies given attention. It is only when it is reported. I remember, uh, you know, the killing of um, uh, dozens of uh, vigilantes, also known as Ensake, in neighboring KBC. It was after two days that most of us, you know, started reporting that incident. Even then, the, the prominence given uh, was so disappointing. You know, some papers didn't even carry the, the report. So, and then look at what happened again, a day after, you know, uh, soldiers. In Sena climbs, if one soldier is killed, the whole country will stand still. But here, it's no longer a serious uh, news when uh, our troops are killed because it has become a norm. And uh, 
is rather unfortunate. There is actually the need for um, us to, to have empathy for our troops and then for even the helpless um, citizens who have no one to speak for them. It's really sad. Hmm. Okay, now uh, let's talk about, you know, the whole uh, ruckus, you know, going on in the APC and, uh, you know, uh, reports uh, saying Buni was sacked and, uh, you know, uh, him saying he's not been sacked, you know, when he returns from Dubai, he will, you know, continue in the capacity of uh, chairman of the caretaker committee. And right now on Punch newspaper, we have uh, Buni, Buni's lawyers, rebels colluded to procure judgment stopping convention. You know, that's uh, attributed to El Rufai. Let's just have your thoughts on the whole thing. Yes. What El Rufai did yesterday was to confirm most of the insider stories that uh, we reported, <coughs> other newspapers also reported that all were not well with the ruling party. You know, um, honestly, it's very unlikely for the uh, Yobia governor to come back from um, his medical trip and then um, get back to his seat as caretaker chairman. We reported this based on insider information. You know what happened a few days ago when the Niger State governor um, stormed the National Secretariat in company of um, uh, about nine or thereabout of uh, members of the caretaker committee. And then he held a series of meetings with party officials, with the caretaker members, and then he also saw in um, uh, chairman of uh, the party in the state. And then he also sat on the seat of um, the caretaker chairman, that was Boni. He also parked his vehicle at the position where Boni. So the, the hard writing was clear that there was change of guard at the party. But as you can see, um, you have about uh, 22 um, APC governors, and then Erufai yesterday said 19 of them, with mm -hmm. the consent of uh, the president, they agreed to remove the uh, uh, Buni as caretaker chairman because they accused him and some few governors, I think about three or so, of not um, being uh, ready to um, conduct convention, including the procurement of that order. From what we heard, um, when the president uh, got wind of this, he was furious because um, he so much trusted the caretaker committee and uh, he gave them ample opportunity to do the right thing. You know, when they were appointed, they were given six months to tidy up and then uh, conduct a convention where elected leaders will emerge. And then after the expiration, they met the president and sought for additional time. They were given another six months. It also expired, and then another six months were given. And now they are approaching two years, mm. uh, meaning uh, they are becoming a sit tight um, caretaker committee, which will not all go well for the ruling party. And then with some of the provisions of this um, Electoral Act 2022, if they are not careful, what happened to, to them in Zamfara State will happen to them at the national level. Because if they do certain things, one person will just go to court and then cite one of the provisions of the Electoral Act. And then even if they win the presidency, don't be surprised that a court will sack all of them and give all the positions to the opposition political parties. So I think it was based on this that the, the president, alongside governors, um, decided to kick out the caretaker committee and then they, they gave the, the position to um, the governor of Niger State, who will most likely be there for only three weeks or thereabout.
Oh, there seem to be quite a lot of reactions from people in regards to the alliance formed by some uh, airline operators in the country. Why is this? Ordinarily, it should be a thing of joy for Nigerians. But um, going by uh, recent happenings, the alliance by AIP's Asman, Aero Contractors and a few others also um, elicited um, uh, negative reactions. You know, a few days ago, they increased the, the minimum um, rate for domestic uh, traveling to 50,000. Mm. Meaning if, even if you are traveling two or three months ahead of time, you will not get a ticket for less than 50, thousand you know and this was all like what obtained before that um, if you want to travel and then you book far ahead of time you get the ticket almost free because you see the charges from maybe twenty thousand or, or thereabout and then this was reflected in all the sites of all the um, uh, carriers so Nigerians were really not happy uh, when they did that, even though they denied it, they attributed the, the increase to natural causes, as they, they put it. Now, um, alliance in the aviation industry is actually um, something that you find all over the world. International airlines, they have alliances, and it is meant to ease their operations and to also reduce the risk of um, uh, subjecting <laughs> travelers to untold hardship. And um, in a nutshell, what it means is that if you book, um, uh, let's say, airpiece to travel from Lagos to Abuja, and then something happened, you will have the opportunity of using your ticket to come to Abuja uh, through aero contractors or any other career which is in the alliance. Um, but the fear is that they are gradually forming a cartel. And you know what that means. When, when you have a cartel, meaning you can manipulate the market to your advantage. So while many people <laughs> commended the initiative, uh, some experts in the aviation industry said uh, it should not just be allowed to be uh, the spring alliance as the uh, airliners now uh, uh, name it that regulatory agencies should also be part of it to make sure that um, uh, travelers are not short change so um, from my uh, perspective i think it's a positive thing uh, because um, it will reduce the pressure on the airlines on one hand and then it will also give uh, some confidence for travelers to continue to patronize the aviation sector. Okay, so but what about uh, a story on the Punch newspaper that says, you know, uh, airfare hike looms yet again, you know, over aviation fuel price, you know, a marketer saying that uh, they're predicting it's going to be uh, 700 naira per liter. Already is above 600, something that ordinarily should cost um, 160 or thereabout. So you can see the increment more than 300% um, or thereabout. And then uh, the, you, you know, the aviation industry is completely deregulated. There is no subsidy for them. They buy uh, the aviation well, based on uh, market forces. And they are not Father Christmas. Because if um, the time you are buying it at 200 or thereabout, you charge, uh, let's say, the 50,000 that is there now. And then you now have an increment of 200%. That is around 700. What do you do? They have no option but to um, also increase the, the fare because they, they just have to maintain the aircraft, they have to pay their staff and all that. I see us remaining in this trouble until when we 
put our house together. You can see all over the world, um, uh, OPEC members are celebrating the hike <coughs> in uh, prices of crude oil, right? But here in Nigeria, we are lamenting because we are using the gains to now pay subsidy and then bring fuel uh, back to the country for domestic consumption. It's, it's really sad. The way out for Nigeria is to quickly fix our refineries, build more refineries, then give um, maybe support to private individuals to also have refineries. Of course, um, in other places they are talking about green energy and all that, but it's not yet time for us here. Because it's not an easy task. You can see for over 60 years we are yet to get it right with even the um, uh, petroleum uh, uh, this thing, not to talk of green energy. So we should still give serious attention to our refineries so that we can refine the product here and then sell it at affordable prices for both the aviation uh, and then for uh, our cars, trucks, and all that. That is the only way, because subsidy is not sustainable. Mm. It has multiplier effect on the economy. Mm. Very, very interesting. <clears throat> it seems um, we are yet again faced uh, with another very sad cruelty situation as uh, on the Daily Trust, there's a story about a 13-year-old girl was gang raped by seven men in Lagos. Yes, that's just an isolated incident that was reported yesterday. Let me put it mildly, because if you like, you can have a whole edition with cases of rape in Nigeria, because you know it, it happens almost every hour, uh, and then <coughs> you see the culprits, food dragging, causing a lot of delays in, 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 in our courts. And then I, I, I think I, I blame our legal system because the justice delivery is so weak and then it takes a lot of time and resources, even when you have all the evidence against the, the culprits. You see, I keep making reference to, to, to other countries because that is the only way um, to now show that it is our attitude, it is our, our rule of law, and it is because of the way we handle some of these heinous acts that the perpetrators uh, think that they can do whatever they like to to go, you know, scot free. Because you wonder, 13 year old girl, and then seven men descending on her. For what? Definitely not for pleasure, you know, it's for maybe rituals. Then what, 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 what rules in our books, you know, are there, you know, checkmating some of these, um, you know, heinous acts? You know, some will be advised to rape. Some will be advised to now kill and then bring some parts to, uh, you know, ritualists just to, to, to get rich. And then if somebody is taken to court, you <coughs> see the case starting from uh, magistrate and then later it will go to um, uh, high court. And then despite all evidences, you see the, the case for dragging for years. This gives uh, courage to other people to actually, um, you know, go into such acts. So I think there is a need for us to change the rule by, you know, not necessarily on, um, you know, crimes like that, on anything that uh, instead of saying somebody is innocent until, uh, you know, he is proven guilty, that any other person should be seen as guilty, that he should prove himself mm -hmm. that he's innocent. Because that is the easiest way. In some Francophone countries, this is what they do. You know, if somebody is caught, and then the, the verdict is that he's guilty. And yeah, and then for him to be set free, he has to prove that he is actually innocent. 
but here in Nigeria, you know, reverse is the case, and that is why people are going uh, free. Somebody, look at the case in Kano, Hanifa. Hanifa yes, her, you know, killer proprietor. After confessing, after writing, you know, and confessing that he actually killed her, later on, he, he said he was forced by the police to, uh, to, to now, you know, uh, say that he was uh, guilty. And then now the, 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 uh, the, the evidence was shifted to the police to prove that, you know, he was not forced. But I thank the judge. I was really happy mm -hmm. yesterday when he admitted, you know, the, 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 the facts presented by the police at initial. So we should try in Nigeria to avoid all these needless technicalities because that's the only way to show citizens that if you misbehave, you are in for trouble. Okay. Now uh, let's talk about you know, uh, uh, the Deputy Inspector General of Police, Ebunike, who actually slumped in his office and uh, you know, died a few days ago. Some people are actually suspecting foul play uh, who was involved in the Abakari case. <laughs> uh, you see, may he so rest in peace. It was really sad. He was one of um, the finest police officers that we have in the country. And uh, he's heading, he was, I mean, heading one of the uh, most sensitive offices, uh, you know, at the force headquarters. Uh, therefore, his death uh, could be described as a serious tragedy for Nigeria. And then, you know, it will definitely affect many ongoing investigations. Mm. Of course, mm. he was not doing it alone. He, he had some people around him and then uh, somebody will definitely take over from where he stopped. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, saying he died simply because he was investigating the uh, Abakari case, as far as I am concerned, uh, that claim, you know, will not uh, stand mm. uh, because maybe after an autopsy, we will know, but um, from uh, the feelers, we are, uh, you know, some were attributing the death to stress that um, he was um, overworked because he, investigate, he was investigating uh, multiple cases and then he really, really rest. And then some said he was choked up by a bone that he was eating or something like that, yes. And then, you know, a bone hooked him in his throat and then he was um, coughing. And then when he was taken to hospital before, you know, it, he died. There are many... Uh, school of thoughts, but I am sure that um, uh, the police authorities, in collaboration with um, the uh, hospitals where he was uh, taken to before he died, will unravel the, the mystery behind his death. But I don't think if it is a certain incantation somewhere that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, I think with that, uh, we will uh, wrap up uh, the newspaper review. Thank you so much, Hamza Idris, General Editor, Daily Trust, for joining us on this segment today. Not necessarily uh, tribal or regional.